Um, we're going to be um, speaking to uh, five women who are working in the fields of climate change, and we're going to be hearing their stories. And one of the common themes is just going to be the importance of showing up, which is what you've done here today. Um, my name is Avishai Artsy. I'm a producer at KCRW. Thank you. KCRW is one of the sponsors of the event. Um, I produce a show called Design and Architecture that airs on Tuesday afternoons. And um, thank you. And uh, um, one of the topics that we do often address on the show is the environment and climate change. And that could be everything from um, the manufacturing of electric buses. I don't know how many of you knew that Los Angeles is actually becoming quite a hotbed of electric bus manufacturing. We just visited the Proterra facility in the City of Industry last week. They have their groundbreaking uh, next month. Um, we've done everything from um, um, looking at Grid Alternatives, a great local nonprofit that does, uh, does work on um, They do free uh, solar rooftop installations. And um, we've also looked at um, drought resistant landscaping, stories like that. Um, buildings are one of the greatest uh, emitters of um, greenhouse gases, and so we've also looked at energy efficiency in buildings and um, transportation. So those are all things that um, we often address, and those are some of the topics that I think will come up here today. Um, so I'd like to introduce the uh, five people that are going to be telling their stories. We'll start with uh, a commissioner on LADWP and director of climate justice at the Center for Popular Democracy. Please welcome Aura Vasquez. Um, next is uh, the project coordinator at the Institute of Sustainability at Cal State Northridge. That's Kayana Lucero. We, we have a uh, consultant on Muslim Public Affairs Commission, that's Adina Likovic. She's a policy director of Black Women for Wellness, that's Norbese Flint. And lastly, uh, She's the governor, go, governing council member on the LA County uh, Women and Girls Initiative and the executive director of the Miguel Contreras Foundation, Araceli Campos. <laughs> right, well, thank you all for coming here today. And I think we'll start with just a simple question, which is, how did you get here? What, um, what has inspired you to get involved in uh, climate change issues and the environment? And um, we could start. Our do you want to begin? <laughs> sure. It's hard to see who is in the audience, so um, it's pretty bright out here. So it's exciting to be here. I'm Aura Vasquez, and uh, one of the reasons why I got into this work, I think, is that really early on with my family. I'm originally from Colombia. And I immigrated here when I was 18, but my family was very like involved where we're from. And um, I think at age around 11, I saw a movie about um, global warming and the ozone layer, a science movie. And this is back in the 80s, um, you know, when I was younger. <laughs> and at, at the movie and at this show, they talked about the, the, the hole in the ozone layer. And, and, and see water rise level, and I think that that was like the first time that I saw really the world that I knew as it was really being challenged and conflicted and in danger. And I just remembered I couldn't stop talking to my family about what I seen in the movie. And later on I went to school and, and I asked to talk to my principal about the movie. And I told her that I have seen all these struggles that we're, we were facing pretty soon, the, you know, the, the climate change that back then was um, global warming and you know she posed the best question I think that the, the question that really changed and shaped my career which is what are you going to do about it so she asked me she said so what do you want to do about it and and I looked at her and I said well you know in the show they talked about using public transportation they talked about the aerosols you know back in the 80s with the curls and the hair and, um, and you know, the, that was kind of like the call to action. So I founded the first environmental club in my school. And we went around and educated people about uh, the ozone layer, the hole in the ozone layer, and the, um, you know, and, and global warming. And, and, you know, 20, 30 years later, here I am sitting 
is still fighting climate change, is still dealing with the deniers, is still dealing with a government that doesn't take the environment seriously, is still dealing with the struggles that happens to our communities, especially communities of color, women, uh, poor people in this country, and how, you know, we, I'm still educating and I'm still working on this issue, and I hope that I don't die before uh, I don't really have to be um, speaking about this issue, but it actually is in the front for of uh, government and everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Karen, do you want to say a little bit about what you're working on? Um, sure. So I work at the Institute for Sustainability at Cal State Northridge, I'm a project coordinator there. And I got into this position, I've always actually been interested in working with animals, and I went to school to work with the animals and got passionate about the environment that way. Decided to go back to school and I got a degree in marine biology and minored in sustainability. And the classes that I was able to take in sustainability um, are interdisciplinary, and so they were able to open my eyes to a bunch of different facets of sustainability, from communicating a sustainability message, um, to talking about different um, facets from waste to energy to water. Um, so that really opened my eyes to a much larger picture of everything and how it's connected. Um, so I actually started working at the Institute for Sustainability at CSUN after I took those courses. They offered me a position. And right now we're working on a, a grant that we have through LADWP, a community partnership grant. And so we just got done wrapping up that grant and we worked with about 1,400 school children. And so I think what really inspires me is seeing the young kids and getting them interested in sustainability and seeing how excited they get working on projects. And we actually had uh, one teacher who just responded to us that they did projects where they took kilowatt meters home, so something that you plug into the wall and then plug electrical devices into it. And they figured out how much uh, electricity different devices were using and how much they were even using when they weren't, when there wasn't anything plugged into them when they were turned off. And so they went around and decided how much money they could save by unplugging devices and calculated that savings and figured it out and presented their parents with that information and said that they could now afford to buy them a new iPhone with all the money they were saving. <laughs> <laughs> so seeing, seeing them really put that into action um, and making those differences in their life is really inspiring. Very cool, and I want to hear more about what's going on in the classroom level. Um, but Idina, hey, let's turn to you. Um, you work a lot with the Muslim community and tell me about how um, climate change is being considered there and, and, and to what degree is this something that um, you feel like you're really excited about? Absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. It's really exciting to be here with people who care about this issue enough to be here on a weekday afternoon. Um, and so for me, um, I have worked as a, an activist in the American Muslim community for about 15 years. Um, I come from a, a media an aspirational media uh, background um, and uh, and began to work on social justice issues that impacted the American Muslim community after 9-11. And so much of my work is focused on um, multi-faith community building and on uh, uh, working on campaigns around social justice issues across communities and within the differences within my community. So while I've cared about the environment certainly you know, since I was a, a child, um, it has quite honestly, uh, become a back burner issue for me, or became a back burner issue for me, the more that post 9-11 political realities dictated, you know, human rights abuses, right? And so those issues became front burner. Um, but uh, along, and, and so that's where I've spent the majority of my career. But along the way, because I work in community building, also in getting our communities to um, work on issues that are beyond and, and uh, transcend the Muslim quote unquote issues, or uh, Muslim only issues, um, the, the, I've come across projects that have uh, changed my point of view and that have deepened my personal commitment to the issue of climate change and seeing how it intersects with other community issues. So you could take the Muslim community and interchange it with the African American or the Latino or the you know any other sub community right or specialized community. And within our community, um, what uh, I was inspired ten years ago by a group called Green Muslims that was focused on finding the connection between environmental policy and scripture, right? And uh, and the values that our faith, teacher, faith teaches us. 
And so in seeing their work and seeing how they focused first on just starting with, you know, some of you might know that we just ended our month of Ramadan, which is fasting, we've known by as being about fasting. There's a lot of uh, community dinners. And so they started by hosting green iftars, right? Iftar is the fast-breaking meal. It's dinner during Ramadan. And uh, their focus was on zero trash, uh, zero trash uh, goal uh, in specific mosques. And they started this campaign that has over the years become um, internationally known and replicated. And because of the internet and social media, has become a broader campaign. And so that really became um, an inspiration point for me. And another big one happened at the mosque that I grew up in. So my family's from the former Yugoslavia, um, but I came to the States when I was just a baby and grew up in San Diego, where the mosque that I went to growing up was sort of your traditional old school house of worship, right, that was um, not up to date with technology, let alone social issues. But fast forward to today, and just in the last year, my home mosque in San Diego has uh, adopted solar panels when it uh, renovated its parking lot um, so that they have those uh, solar panels that go, you know, and also provide shade for the cars. And they've become literally a green mosque in that way. And they are part of an international rising movement um, of, of faith communities that are trying to lead the charge when it comes to these kinds of changes. So, whereas for me in the past it has felt again like a back burner issue, I'm really excited and feeling inspired by the ways that it has become uh, more of a front burner issue and that's seen as foundational to our faith. It's great to hear those stories because it's those aren't the kind of stories that we often hear in the mainstream media about the issues that. The Muslim community cares about. It, you so don't say. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, anyway, and, and I think we should talk more about um, how to make climate change a more immediate issue when it's not, it doesn't feel like an immediate existential threat the way other issues feel, especially right now, um, politically. Um, I want to keep moving on though, so um, we're basic. Okay, so we uh, we talked earlier, and um, you, your group, Black Women for Wellness, um, you say you work kind of the reproductive justice realm as well as the environment. So tell me a little bit more about yourself and how you uh, became interested in both of those issues. This world, yes. Um, so first I want to say how excited I am to be here. Um, this is my, my first Cobra moment, the couch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, how did I get to my work? Um, so I am the daughter of a reproductive justice advocate and the cousin of a reproductive justice advocate. And, um, and to be clear about reproductive justice, um, it's a different than reproductive health when we run for rights. And it's this inclusive um, space in which we talk about everything having to do with not having a child, not having a child, and being able to raise your family with dignity and respect. So that's environment, that's economics, that's criminal justice issues. It's a, it's a, it's a wide range of things. And I came to this, well, I saw my family in this work, and I said that I would never do it. Um, I was like, oh my goodness, nonprofits, somebody needs to make money in the family, and that is not uh, nonprofit work. But um, as I got up, um, I started doing the work um, in school, and um, you know, volunteering, and things like that, I did what I knew, right? And what I knew was helping women, women of color, and particularly for me, black women. And so my role to Black Women for Wellness has to do with if it's not me advocating for myself, then who is, right? Um, and me being the person to stand up for it. And in terms of an environment and that, that space, I think that we, Black Women for Wellness, has this space in which we um, work in the intersections, right? Bringing both the ideas and space around um, how important it is for us to care about climate, right? We all live on planet Earth. Um, as far as I know, we haven't figured out how to get to another Earth. Um, so, like, this is all we got. But also bringing those intersections of, like, how do we look at the in-betweens of affordable housing and economics and um, women's health and how that is also intersects with climate change as well. And that is the space in which um, I think I'm most happy about when talking about climate change um, and where, our, um, where I bring my voice to. I don't know if that answered your question. Um, well, I mean, because you do work in two different worlds, intersectionality I think is important because people need to show up for climate change and people who care a lot about climate change need to show up for other issues too. 
Right, and so I was um, following up. What was your name again, Bob? The, um, Dina. Dina. So following up Dina, right, um, was essentially uh, the same kind of thing, like climate change wasn't the, on the pro forefront of our, our, um, our organization, but other organizations came and said, look, this is, this is something that we need to be paying attention to, right? And we did, but I also think we did it in a way to start looking at Bill's policies around climate change, but doing it in a way that is inclusive of communities of color and inclusive of women's voices, right? Because to me, you're not doing climate change work if you're not having those voices in the space. That's right. Um, okay, so, so, Arisana, so um, when we talked, you mentioned that your uh, parents worked in a factory in Southeast LA, and um, that kind of opened your eyes to some of these issues of both workplace issues and also environmental issues. Can you tell me a little bit more about your family and then what got you interested in uh, the environmental issues? Sure, and also I want to say thank you for having me, everyone. I'm so honored to be here, getting to uh, voice some of the issues that so many uh, in LA face. People like my parents, who I mentioned um, to our moderator, um, you know, came to the US from Mexico to work in factories and low wage work. Um, as a child, I would go with my sister, who's here in the audience today, um, to visit my mom at her factory in Vernon. And, and um, if you really um, grow up in these issues, if you grow up like so many communities, um, here in LA, and so I also work um, on issues of environmental justice at, at an intersection, meaning I don't directly interface with these issues through my organizations, um, but I do want to say that um, one thing I've learned about being involved as a commissioner, um, that, that my message here today to everyone in this audience who is so engaged by being here today is that you too can get involved. I first was uh, appointed um, uh, as a commissioner um, in my late 20s or early 30s, became president of the city's uh, women's commission. I'm um, now uh, also working on the county. So it, despite the election that happened, you all know from today, but also in other intersections, it's a great time um, to be a woman. It's, it's the year of the woman in LA. Regardless this year, you should know that um, there's tremendous initiatives happening. Mayor Garcetti was here earlier at the intersection on gender, um, which I, uh, there's a lot of work happening in this administration. We, for example, commissions are, are people who don't work in government, commissioners are people who don't like me, who don't work in government but want to be engaged and have a voice in government. At the city level, there's about 500 in the county. There's another maybe thousand at the state as well. And so it's really for anyone to get involved. And that's how, that's the first way to get access um, for communities who are traditionally not represented to have that voice. And so if you grew up like me, parents like, like mine, um, who understand what it's like to intersect in all these different issues, it's so important that you step forward into these government roles influencing um, I'll talk more about the heyday of, of that's happening, this renaissance for women, but it's extending to the, you, you saw Mayor Garcetti's administration, the, for the first time, implementation on a major uh, scale of CEDAW, a convention on a treaty, international treaty, convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, which, like a lot of environmental um, Work is happening not at the U.S. level, which has not the U.S. has not ratified CEDA, but LA has and is now aggressively implementing. That means all the departments in the city are working on gender equity plans. Similarly, uh, just in December, we now have a county board of supervisors overseeing over 10 million residents of LA that implemented a women and girls initiative, um, of which I'm now the chair and really excited because that initiative is doing similar broad-based work to ensure that the women and girls in the county of LA have better services, um, have better um, representation within government, and that's really important. That's where you all come in. Great, thank you. Well, I feel like um, now that you've introduced yourselves, we know a little bit more about each of you. Um, one of the questions that has been on my mind is, um, say you don't necessarily work directly in uh, climate change issues or in the environment, but you work in something adjacent to it, and you want to bring climate change into the conversation, and it may not be happening. How do you do that? What is, maybe if any of you can give me examples of ways that you've found um, a way to bring 
environmental issues, um, energy efficiency, renewable energy, something in, into your world or into your community to, and connect, connect it directly to the issues that are facing people um, in their homes or in the workplace. Um, does someone want to go first? Um, at CSUN, we take a few different initiatives. You know, we work directly with students, so we try to empower the students and give them opportunities to be the change. Um, so we have a few things that we do. We give away uh, reusable utensil house pouches and stainless steel straws to any student that comes into our office and wants one. Um, and we really like to give out those items because they give the students an opportunity to spark a conversation. So if you're out at dinner and you pull, you bring your reusable water bottle, or you, you use your own utensils, pull out your own metal straw, and you're with your friends, it brings up a conversation um, to talk to your peers and inform them about changes that they could be making in their daily lives as well. Um, and I really think that it's important to make small changes. You know, we might not think that they're making a difference in the long run, but they really are. If everyone makes a small change, it does add up. Um, and that's how we make a, a larger scale changes, starting with something small, um, something even as little as a straw. There's, in the United States, we use 500 million plastic straws every day. Um, and you know that those are made from carbon products that continue, contribute to climate change. They also contribute to pollution. A lot of those end up in the ocean. Um, so yeah, even something that small, they don't get recycled. Um, so even something that small can make a really large difference if everyone does it, and by giving the students the opportunity to bring up that conversation, it can be really helpful. I think um, in, in the topic of climate change, it's important to understand other people's self-interest. Um, not all of us uh, feel as strongly as we do, not a lot of us are exposed. And I think a lot of people are also exposed and don't know how environmental issues affect them. Uh, in terms of pollution, LA is the uh, LA with the most pollution in the country uh, since 1979. So, I mean, that should that should at least say that you know we're all affected by climate change and by pollution at least. Um, I think that especially in this last election, we really saw uh, at the presidential level the difference between understanding what how climate change affects you. And if you are willing to act on climate, or if you're going to become a climate denier, and I think that I see today in a lot of tables and a lot of conversations, uh, folks that are friends and family, and they see this issue as something that is so far removed and something that doesn't have like a real solution, like a practical solution, and that, and that really scares a lot of folks. And I think that the best way to talk about or, or relate this issue is to talk about your story to talk about how that's, that is affecting you and how it affects your community or your family or your neighborhood. And I think that is a lot easier to have a conversation, whether it's somebody that is uh, really ready to have a uh, really, uh, change of heart or somebody that is already supporting um, you know, any policies around climate change or somebody that is definitely not even in the spectrum. So I think that there is nothing more powerful than your own personal experience and what you can share with other people about how climate change is affecting you. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. All right. um, so I love complicating stories. Um, and I think a lot of times when we ask the question, like how do we get people more involved in climate change, um, we don't ask the, the question, how do climate change get more involved in the community, right? And my question is, is like, is, it's a conversation of yes, bringing people in, but also where is the reciprocity? Um, and how does that play out, right? So, for example, um, a lot of times there are folks, folks descend into communities of color, particularly during elections, and say, you know, climate is really important, and it is, right? But then they disappear after the election, and we don't see them until the next election. Um, meanwhile, while we're fighting for people dying on the streets, right, or getting shot by police, um, women's health, um, affordable housing rent is too damn high, right? Um, and all those things, it's silence, right? And so to have these conversations about how we like, uh, how we show up, right? We have to also think about how do we show up for each other, right? How is climate change showing up for community organizations and bringing that conversation? So yes, relating it to affordable housing and transportation and all those things, right? But also not disappearing when we need you. 
Um, and so that is like, I feel like the conversation I would want to add and push into. And um, when we ask that question of how do we bring climate to communities um, or how do we get communities more involved, it's like, how are you getting more involved in the community? How, how would you like to see, in any of you, how would you like to see folks who are involved in climate change or the environment show up for other things? What are the other things that we should be showing up for? And um, just as we're trying to pull people in and make them understand the importance of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, to what, to what degree can we lend a hand in, in other issues and, and build those bridges and make the connections between, you know, um, lead pollution in the soil and um, you know the people who um, are forced because of rising housing prices to live by the freeways, you know. Um, there are so many ways that the environment intersects with um, economics and social justice issues. So I'd love to hear some ideas of, of how do you make those connections. I think, I think in, in the work I've seen, um, when you go into the details of what adding a gender lens to government is or to labor, is you understand that it has ramifications in so many ways. And that's why representative democracy is so important. And you need political actors, elected officials, like Sheila Kuhl, um, who started this Women and Girls Initiative, like Mira Garcetti, like Mira Garcia, who talked earlier about representative democracy in ways that play out in many facets, but also in environment. For example, um, one thing that was achieved for the first time ever in LA city history was gender parity on commission appointments. That had never happened before the Garcetti administration in the history of LA. So you think there is women's commissions like, like mine, but there's many others that have, that have a role in gender, but that have a role in environment. For example, planning commissions. It's, so, it's not a space that people often look to to see, um, you know, what's, is there gender justice there? Is there you know, representation of women there, but that has such a big influence on uh, having gender parity and planning commissions has such a big influence on the decisions that affect communities in terms of environment. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll also add that we have LA County, which is just over 10 million people, one million of those, one out of 10 is undocumented. So you have a county with a huge immigrant population that is not allowed at this time to serve on these commissions or in an, an elected office. But we do have neighborhood councils. We have someone here today, Alessandro Negrete, who's the first ever undocumented neighborhood council member. And then it's a lot of courage that he has. Um, he's also a proud member of the LGBT community. And so really intersecting all these different things. And so that's why, for me, inter intersectional uh, rep true representation and holding elected officials accountable to uplift and diversify because that is, that is it, has, it has to be a real intention that elected officials make to ensure that this happens. If you look at a huge international climate uh, leader, you think of someone like Mayor Hidalgo in Paris, um, and you look at, what, but she didn't just become Mayor Hidalgo and do all these great things, chair of the C40 group and all these things on the environment. She was a deputy mayor for many years under administration that supported her leadership, and that's why she became such an environmental champion. But somebody putting women and women from the community who represent those voices in these positions is everything. I definitely can testify to that. But I think in, in the sense of does the, does the climate justice, environmental justice, environmental world show up in my community or do I, my community shows up? And, and I think that sometimes, I mean, I've seen, I've seen them both happen in, in different campaigns and in different moments, but I just like to remind everyone that we are our community. I am my community. My mother is my community. My dad is my community. My neighbors are my community. And it's my duty to uplift this issue in that you know, ecosystem. And if it's not uplifted yet, it's my duty to uplift that issue in my community. So if the, any, and, and I feel like this applies to any issue. Any, any issue in general. If, this, if, if there is an issue that is not really being addressed and is affecting all of us, it's our duty to uplift it and make it mainstream and make it heard and make it known. It's about the health of your community, but it's specifically about a discovery that you made in your neighborhood. And something that you found out was there that you had no idea. Yeah, so um, uh, so I've um, been working in environment 
stuck for a while, um, particularly fracking and oil exudation. Um, and uh, we were talking to some funders, um, and one day there was like a tour, they were doing a tour of fracking wells. So I was like, oh, okay. And they did a video of it, I'm watching the video. And so they pulled up to this one place, and I was like, I wonder why they stop in there, right? It's around the corner from where I lived. And they pull out, and they walk down the stairs, and they point, and then it's a well that's around the corner from my house. Um, and I'm like, I thought I was pretty woke. Um, and there's like this well that's around it, and we always thought it was construction, right? And so for me, it was kind of an eye-opening space and the thing of like, we, for somebody who was involved, like, <coughs> pretty in the of what's going on in the community. I was around the corner from a well and didn't even know it. And that is how like insidious things are. Cause they didn't even bother to tell the community, right? It was like the people who are next door, but if you're like next to the next door, that's it, you didn't know. You just have these weird smells every once in a while and things like the People were getting sick because of Oh, people are getting hella sick. Um, sorry, my Bay Area. Um, but yeah, people were getting sick right now. Um, and then not only here, um, well not here, but the, the one that I live next to, but there was one actually down by USC um, where people, I mean, was aware of cancers, nosebleeds, that's Veronica Center um, Community Housing Center was the one that discovered that one. And um, they called Barbara Lee, um, not Barbara Lee, uh, Barbara Boxer, excuse me, office about it. Barbara Boxer sent somebody down and her staff person got immediately sick from being in that space, right? And so, these people are living next to these wells every single day, trying to figure out what's going on. We thought it was like a nice little grassland in front and realizing that behind this like wall, right, it's like they're pumping chemicals into the ground, into our air, and nobody knows. Um, I think that's such a good example of the way we can be very focused on um, big federal and global issues and in some ways be blind to things that are happening even in our own backyards. Um, even when we think that we're totally plugged in with what's going on in our community, there are always things that we may not be aware of. And, um, you know, I, th I think, and I speak for myself personally, it's easy to share um, stories on Facebook about things that outrage us, you know, with the administration appointing um, a climate denier to, to have the EPA, things like that, and or, you know, um, the administration pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement. And those are all Im important things that we should be paying attention to. But as we do that, we often forget about the little victories that are happening here in our own community. So I'd love um, maybe just as we wrap up to hear about some of the little victories that you're seeing, um, either that you're personally involved in or you've been hearing about, that sort of give you a feeling of hope and optimism that as we move forward, despite what's happening at the federal level, um, that there's really amazing things being done in California, here in um, Southern California, that make you think that things are gonna be okay. I mean, let's not forget that really California is stepping up and leading the way. And I like to say that when they go low, we really show up, you know, here in California. So, I mean, I mean, even just today, for example, the city of LA, the second largest city in this country, just divested from Wells Fargo. And this is a And I think for a lot of us that made the track a couple of times, to standing rock and went to support our indigenous community and our environment in general. Uh, we were we, we've been really involved and really utilizing that you know expression of following the money. And I think uh, the city of Seattle did it. We just did it today, so that's exciting. We have a couple of state bills that are trying to get us to the finish line to to the finish line to 100% renewables. So we have um, uh, Senator Pro Tem Kevin De Leon. He's been a a real champion on environmental justice issues. I mean, and then other smaller things, as a, as a DWP commissioner, for me, it was really, really important to uphold the principles of the Paris Agreement. So just last week, we approved a resolution really explaining how we're doing it even better and how we're going to really continue uplifting those principles, just like Major Garcetti and the city of LA has done it. So I think there's a lot of exciting things happening in terms of oil drilling and urban drilling in general. Uh, there is a very exciting coalition here called Stand LA, really working on, on, on really bringing a lot of different communities together to address this issue that has been happening in LA for so long. And for those of you that know LA history, know how it's been uh, urban dream in 
important in our history and also the motor vehicle uh, you know, industry. So I think there's a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, intersectionality is the hot thing now. You know, I help organize the People's Climate March in Washington, D.C., and we were very, very intentional in, um, in, in bringing all those voices and the different, uh, you know, movements that are also struggling with the same issues that, that with the same issues that we have, which is a federal government that is not really interested in supporting poor people or women or immigrants or LGBT community or just anyone that doesn't look like them or has as much money as they have. I, I want to build on the point about um, creating inclu inclusion and the reciprocity aspect, the intersectionality. I think all of these things, they seem really sexy right now, but I, I but this is also what gives me hope, is that because this has become front burner, um, that the issue of who is being represented in these movements is becoming an issue of discussion, front burner discussion. And I think that that goes alongside so many other issues that are going on in our country and the left you know, building its power. Um, and I think that right now, this presents a really hot moment of potential where um, communities that are you know, not the usual suspects um, are being uh, invited into conversations that, um, that transcend a lot of the differences that we have in other spaces. Um, you know, look, I, I, it'll surprise you that as a Muslim, I think on some level that this is also space where we can get like, you know, the, the never Trump people, you know, sort of into the conversation too and talk, about, you know, kind of across the aisle. They're still Republicans, but they, uh, they are not, not down with this president. Um, so I think that there's opportunities in those spaces. And I think that on the faith front, you know, I think about it as an, as an unusual suspect, not just for the Muslim community, but so many faith communities. I think that the left has become fractured and faith communities are sort of outside of these conversations. And, you know, whereas, you know, when you think about the civil rights movement or previous social justice movements, faith actors were sort of leading the charge. This conversation around faith and values has fallen out of many of our um, greatest social justice campaigns and causes. And I think that we have an opportunity to infuse it because the right shouldn't have the dominant conversation when it comes to faith and values. We on the left who um, support uh, uh, support our environment, you know, there's an Islamic saying uh, we uh, that we believe Prophet Muhammad said that, um, that we should take care of the earth because it is our mother. Uh, that this fundamental idea is also an Islamic idea. And so thinking about how we reinforce some of these ideas and put these faith ideas out into the public square as part of the climate change, um, the, the, yeah, the, the climate protection movement, um, I think is just as critical and is an opportunity that really speaks to this moment that we're living in. I have to agree with that and that smaller groups are feeling more empowered um, to stand up for themselves and getting more involved politically and, and uh, just making their voice more heard. Um, so I think that's really inspiring that those groups are, are starting to get their, their voices out there. Um, I know our, our president at CSUN has made um, a lot of climate commitments as well. So it's inspiring to see that even though our president of the United States has pulled us out of the, that agreement to see California and Los Angeles and universities stepping up to fill that void, um, our president of the university has made sustainability one of her seven priorities. Um, so it's one of her major goals for the university and we're, we're hoping to get our university um, climate neutral by 2040. So. Um, we're, we're working on, on those ourselves, and we also have a resiliency goal for our surrounding communities. So it's a very large university. We have about 40,000 students, so even just our university is doing great things, but we're, we're expanding that to the community and working with local businesses um, to try and get them up to putting in pool roofs and making more resiliency strategies so that if awful things do happen from climate change, as we're seeing, that they're prepared to deal with those, those issues. Climate change still a major topic you think on the minds of um, students at CSUN or um, compared to all the many issues that are out there do you feel like that's still something that is getting people yes and no um, it's still definitely a struggle to bring the conversation forward we actually did um, a survey of students a couple years ago where we polled all CSUN students while well, a sampling of CSUN students like a general population and then compared that to the students that were signing up for our sustainability minor and we did find that students that are signing up to take the sustainability classes um, have a, a larger knowledge of climate issues. 
um, than the general population, so they are kind of self-selecting, which is an issue because the students that are the ones that know the most about these issues are the ones wanting to learn more. Um, so we are trying to reach out to more of a general population. Um, we do events on campus, we do um, signage where we just put facts out about climate around the campus so that the students that aren't in a class just walking by will read that information and uh, that will kind of get into their heads. And like I said, we do the giveaway items. So we're trying to reach out to a, a broader audience, but it is an issue of, of the self-selecting students that are, are the most interested in, in wanting to learn more and do better. Um, we're almost out of time, um, our Sally and basic. Did you want to share something that you've been seeing happening uh, that gives you hope, that inspires you? I'll share in a, in a room full of uh, people who believe in science, like my sister, the scientist, and she trust science. I think it's important for folks to know that LA has really moved to a data-driven um, approach within government, and, and the motto there is it's not uh, measured, it's not monitored, and so all these gains um, that have begun on gender equity issues like parity and commission is one of my many data points. It's something that, that will last long past these administrations because we'll keep an eye on those statistics. I think that's very important to note um, on a, on a um, bigger scale in LA, it's important to, to know that there's, a, and I, I work in labor, there is a new head of the LA County Fed, is uh, mid 30s. Um, similar, we know the average woman in LA is, is early to mid 30s. So um, if there's a new, um, you know, emerging leadership group in LA that is really believing in all these intersectional approaches and issues, and that's a, a very hopeful, a hopeful thing. And I'm, I, you know, certainly very um, encouraged by the young folks who witnessed the Trump election and the aftermath who couldn't vote because they're in middle school and high school and really want to be politically engaged in the next generation. That's very, very important. I think we're in a good moment here, but we have to look at look at those statistics again and, and reflect on the fact that, you know, a third of households are headed by single women, uh, just under 20% women still live in poverty in LA, and that, that their leadership is is getting awesomer every day, but we need to bring up more folks to be truly represented. I heard, um, so there's a couple of things um, I would say. One is hopeful, I don't agree with Governor Brown on everything, but he has been pretty badass when it comes to climate. Um, and so I'm appreciative of being in this state at this moment, right? Seeing like some of our elected officials show up, right? That's not all, but many of them are. Um, I think I'm also um, most excited about is the fact that more people of color, more women, more trans, more queer folks are getting into the spotlight, right? Because even though intersectional, intersectionality might be kind of the new thing at the moment, it's how we've always been doing work. Right? We've always been multi-issued, multi-faceted, and cared about how our communities come together. And so if we lift those voices up, I think in terms of the how we can reimagine our futures right, with climate change, but also just with humanity, um, just in general, could be boundless. And that's what I'm most excited about, is that the things that I can't even think about, that young folks, and folks of color are doing right now, are thinking about right now to change the world for the better. Great. Well, I think it's time to wrap up, um, but I, uh, you know, I feel like uh, I'm, I'll take a lot from this discussion, and I think one of those things is that um, we need to elevate the topic of climate change to um, look at how it connects to different communities, to different groups, and different issues that we all care about, and finding those uh, connections and bridging those divides. Um, so I want to thank all the panelists that have joined us here on stage. And to the audience for, for being here and, um, and coming to Climate Day LA and enjoy the rest of your day.